thank you so much for cu- coming along and uh, chatting to me about your incredible book. And I'm so, so excited. Um, uh, you know, w- I'm going to address you as Dr. Jack Lewis for the first instance and then go straight into the, the more sort of uh, casual form, uh, if that's OK. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Thank you. And so do a quick introduction and get straight into it. So uh, Dr. Jack Lewis has a PhD in neurobiology, I know, from the UCL. Um, He has inspired a wide variety of audiences uh, for Deloitte, ITV, Microsoft, Siemens, Warner Brothers, as well as like science festivals, schools, universities. And he's also helped make like really, really dense material into much more accessible and compelling material for like global audiences of millions and millions by like TV programs on the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, Sky, Discovery, and actually most recently, the uh, I think two series of Secrets of the Brain on Insight TV. Woo-hoo. And um, yay, exactly. Now, now streaming on Curiosity Stream, apparently. That Good to invented know. by the person who uh, started Discovery Channel. I only discovered oh, that a few weeks ago. So that's that actually cool. makes sense. Discovery <laughs> and Insight. Aha. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, and then, you know, I'm so glad to hear that, you know, your book, uh, Sort Your Brain Out, has got its second edition that hit yeah. the shops in September 2021, which is like bravo, you know. So, you know, it's come back. Hit yeah. the shelves again. Everyone updated. go out and buy it. It's yeah. been updated. And so, Jack, thank you for coming. I uh, really Absolute appreciate pleasure. it. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. Yes, and shall we shall we say, you've just come back from the gym looking all fresh-faced, of course. Well, a little bit sweaty and bedraggled, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 my timing wasn't great. My consistency with regard to <laughs> doing what I say in the book people should do to look after their brains, that's good. Yes. Uh, my timing, I had just enough time to eat half my lunch. Uh, but not enough time to hop in the shower so apologies for my bedraggled appearance I figured it would be a podcast an audio podcast only I was, <laughs> sorry. it was only at the last second I was like oh video cast oops. <laughs> that that oops yeah my, my bad <laughs> that was my bad for sure um yeah but like seriously Jack this is a great book and you know I'm super super interested in neuroscience um you know it it affects me like on a day-to-day basis it's very important to me so I've got to ask you first of all like what actually inspired you to write this book with Adrian so um it really boils down to the fact that throughout my neuroscience education I did an undergrad at Nottingham uh, got a first class degree in neuroscience in 2001, went on to do a PhD, uh, got that from UCL in 2005, then went on to Germany to do postdoctoral research. Over that sort of just over a decade, I kept stumbling across really interesting uh, information in the neuroscience literature, like quite hardcore, dense literature, not aimed for broadcast to the general public. And I was sort of finding I could apply these little brain hacks to my own life, but there didn't seem to be anyone out there who was sort of repackaging it in plain English so that everyone could avail themselves of of this sort of brilliant insight into how we can all get more out of our brains. So meeting Adrian was was, was one of the key things. So um, I did a series on on Sky One and uh, a guy saw me on that who organizes events for big big companies. And he contacted me through my website, drjack.co.uk. And he said, hey, how about, you know, doing some motivational speaking? And I was like, all right, uh, I've always fancied it. He's like, yeah, I'm going to fly you out to Tenerife uh, with Ooh. a couple of other motivational speakers, one of whom was Adrian. Um, and and I, want, I want you to do your stuff, like tell, tell everyone about the brain um, up on stage. And I was like, cool, I'll give it a go. It was a real baptism of fire. But I, what I realized when I was in the audience watching Adrian speak was that he's an amazing storyteller. Mm. Like he's, a, he's, an, he's an amazing character. He's a, you know, he has people laughing one minute and has t- tears in their eyes you know, shortly after. And I thought, right, he, he's, he's an amazing storyteller. Like, he's a real personality. With my material and his storytelling ability, if we join forces, um, this could be something really special. And so the first edition of Sort Your Brain Out is what resulted from that. Amazing. Because, yeah, it is so well. It's just so accessible. And I found that really, really helpful because you're right. So most of the time, the material is so super dense and you're reading journals and you're just like, you know unless you really have like a background in science it's very mm. hard to kind of get through that material mm. and but 
and I, I do think maybe that's why people just don't really know much about their brains. So I was wondering, in your opinion, like, why do you think so many people don't actually know anything about how their brains work? It's a really good uh, question. And I think it boils down to the oft repeated phrase uh, by neuroscientists like myself and psychologists and all sorts of scientists. The brain is the most complex thing in the known universe, you know. So that quite understandably leaves people with the uh, sort of presumption that, well, I'm never going to understand it, am I? If the brainiest people out there think it's the, the, the hardest thing uh, to, to, to sort of understand and, and will never fully grasp it, then, you know, what hope have I got in understanding? And, and I, think that's, I think that's really, really unhelpful. Like, it's cool to be impressed by how complex your own brain is, but it's very unhelpful to leave people the impression that you can't teach an old dog new tricks mm. because you absolutely can. Like, we, our brains are de designed to sort of adapt to our environment. And if our environment changes, then our brains will change also. Um, but we have a certain degree of free will. We can choose to put ourselves in certain real and virtual environments. And if we put ourselves in fertile environments with lots of stimulation in them that challenge us, that stretch us, then we can, we can change our own brains accordingly. So mm. a lot of what's in Sort Your Brain Out is sort of simple tips that people can uh, you know, put into practice on a daily basis until it becomes habit. And then if you're practicing these things on a daily basis, then there's a good chance they'll change your brain. Mm -hmm. now, the important thing to remember is whatever we do regularly, intensively over long periods of time will change our brain. Mm -hmm. But it's not always for the better. Um, and quite often people miss that point. So if you don't find out what you can do to get your brain working better then other forces out there namely technology firms social media the infinite scroll mm. they will hack your brain and change it yeah. in order to induce habits and behaviors that suit them help them to profit but don't necessarily suit and help the individual so i don't think it's uh, uh, you know it's an option anymore to not be interested in how your own brain works. I think that everyone has a duty to themselves to you know, arm themselves with the knowledge of what they can do to put themselves in the right environments, to expose themselves to the right influences, and then also equally and oppositely to sort of limit their exposure to certain things, and in some cases block them out entirely. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, I'm not saying that it's not like a list of instructions as to what, what, what you must do. It's, it's the information making it available to everyone so that people can stop and think, mull it over with friends and family, you know, and just think for themselves, what's right for me? You know, if you want to play video games for five, six hours a day, and then your brain becomes specialized and adapted to that, well, that's your decision. But you need to understand what the consequences of doing that are in terms of changing your brain in ways that don't suit you very well to the real world. Mm. Yeah, God, you know, I remember watching The Social Dilemma on Netflix and it just freaked the living daylights out of me in terms of how much they hack your brain um, mm. into these kind of addictive behaviours. Um, Absolutely. Which... And, and incidentally, I uh, I saw myself up on the big screen for the first time ever a few weeks ago, oh. a, a couple of months ago. There's an amazing documentary that I contributed to. And it's not amazing because I'm in it. It's really, really <laughs> well made. It's called I Am Gen Z. Ooh. It's been um, uh, broadcast all around the world. And it's kind of like picking up where social, uh, the social dilemma left off. Right. Um, they interview a lot of people, influential people from Silicon Valley. Um, but, but importantly, they look at the Gen Z. They look at the young people who've never known a world without technological yeah. saturation. And by balancing the sort of expert views with real life testimonies from, from young people, it, it was it was a you know, when you contribute to these things, you never know how they're going to cut the film, how the final documentary is going to turn up. I fully expected to appear for 20 seconds and then disappear. But there were, there were lots and lots of contributions. And, and it was good because they were putting neuroscience sort of front and central in the story, which I think is, is I, I'm so proud to have been a part of that yeah. because I think it's a really important message to get out there. Well, as I just said. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so, so necessary because it's true because we never, ever kind of equate the two things together, do we, in terms of the behaviours, the patterns of behaviours that we end up sort of uh, end up with. So the, most people think this kind of psychological kind of aspect of it, but actually there's a lot of neuroscience behind uh, the way we behave. So I was just wondering, like, how do we use technology without it uh, actually turning us into zombies? It's everything in moderation, being aware of the techniques that are used to keep you coming back, like, 
you know, if, if you play games on your phone, um, the, the juice, like the audiovisual um, uh, feedback that you get, like a ling, like a, a sort of sound of success or, or, or a sort of visual um, sparkle, you know, when you do something good, it, it, it gives you this sort of constant positive feedback. Um, and, and it's put together in a very artificial way. Uh, they, they carefully construct the design of these games to maximize the amount of time you spend playing and then to maximize the frequency with which you return to the game for, 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 for extra doses. And so it's basically in training us to engage more and more deeply. Now, that isn't so bad in and of itself, mm. apart from the fact that it displaces time that we could be spending doing other things that are much better for us. You know, like the human did not evolve in, 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 a, in a world where we were constantly sat down and where we were constantly staring at screens in the near distance. And if you don't move around, your muscles don't produce the myokines mm. that travel up to your brain. And these chemicals cause the birth of new neurons in, in your hippocampus, in your, in your memory pathways. And it doesn't just uh, create new brain cells in your memory pathways. It also uh, re-energizes the older hippocampi. So people who are sat around playing games, stimulating their brains, playing on their phone, playing on the computer, whatever, for, for, for long, long periods of time each day, by virtue of being sedentary in order to do that and, and, and displacing all that time they could be spending going outside for, mm. um, you, know, you know, for a walk around the park or whatever, walk through the woods or walk down the river, whatever. If, if you get outside, people who get outside for two to five hours a week, just recreational time, not doing anything and they're in nature for two to five hours, they are happier than those who do not. Mm. It's scientifically proven. It's a very, you know, it was a study with tens of thousands of people. Now, you know, if tech companies are kind of, addicting us to staying indoors and, and and just sort of playing their games in order to be exposed to their adverts or in order to pay more subscriptions it's it's to the benefit of them that the yeah. tech firms profit more by getting billions of us around the world to do this but we as individuals are, are we have a, a brain that is less well off our brain is less healthy as a direct result um and and, and even if you know exercise aside uh, not taking off exercise just just reading a book and using your imagination to imagine the scenes that are described imagine the sounds imagine the tastes imagine the the sort of uh, relationships evolving between different characters um that's really good for your brain like if, if you can if the more you use your imagination then the bigger your imagination becomes, the broader your capacity to imagine scenarios becomes. Um, so like read old school, reading a book is so much better for you than say watching a movie mm. or watching a drama on TV where um, it's, it's convergent thinking, like you're, you're very much narrowed in to what the director has decided to show you. Mm, um, whereas, whereas divergent thinking, the author offers you uh, a story but it's up to your imagination to picture mm -hmm. the faces, to hear the sounds of the voice. And that filling in of the gaps is, is really, really good for us. Like, particularly when it comes to brain aging, if you look at people in the post-retirement years, those who've always done a lot of reading, their brains are just in much better nick than those mm -hmm. who barely ever read and instead just watch screens the whole time. Um, because reading is kind of brain training. Staring at a screen is not, a sort of brain training. And, and when I say brain training, I don't mean like, you know, playing a game that is uh, uh, marketed as being a brain training thing. Right. More often than not, those things <laughs> yeah. don't work. But as in, there are things you can do that get your brain working better. And there are things that you can do that get your brain working worse. And so when I talk about brain training, I'm talking about the former, not the latter. Yes, that makes sense. I've got my keyboard in the back to, you know, to prove my I'm trying to do a bit of brain training. In yeah, that well, me, me too, but that's yeah. my girlfriend's <laughs> piano and that's my girlfriend's cello. So <laughs> oh, right, uh -huh. slightly, slightly uh, misinforming <laughs> the world. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I, that's really interesting because actually I, I liked what you, I remember reading about the nuns who did read. Yes, uh, the nuns, yeah. right. That was fantastic because I was like, oh, that's that's so fascinating because they do le lead such a sort of simple life, but it, it just helps them in the long run, obviously, in terms of the aging mm. process. But I then, mean, the brilliant thing about that nun study was nuns 
all tend to live the same kind of lifestyle. Mm. It's very mm. standardized. So then when you compare those who read a lot to those who don't, nothing else in their life is different because mm. they, they get up at the same time each day. They do the same kind of things each day as part of their duties as a nun. So it was sort of a brilliantly controlled experiment. Yes, it's genius. I've never even thought of like <laughs> nuns as a sort of a study group, but there you go, you know. it was. But And also the other one was the, the taxi drivers because obviously, you know, in this day and age, obviously, you know, you still have people who you know learn the knowledge uh, which obviously is when you learn all the streets and all the landmarks of like uh, London usually and I was just wondering now that obviously we got GPS and technology and stuff is that like obsolete now or is it still mm. worth learning that kind mm-hmm. of information yeah it's a good point um well the main takeaway from the taxi driver study is uh, that you can teach an old dog new tricks so mm. for a long time you, know, you can see with children you can see their abilities change from one month to the next one year to the next you know like because they're starting from such a their capabilities are, are, are quite rudimentary to begin with say in the in the early primary school age and then by the end of primary school they're they're, they're, they're so, so much cleverer they're so much more mm. capable in terms of being able to move their bodies and you know, understanding maths and language and, you know, various other subjects. And, and then going through secondary school as well, you know, it, it bloom, blossoms even more, you know, their, their, their retention of information and their, their cognitive abilities just sort of proliferate in, in, in a very clear and obvious way where you mm. can take a sort of 10-year-old, compare their capacities to a 14-year-old or an 18-year-old, and you see, wow, there's big differences between mm. the kids of different ages. But in adulthood, there's not that positive correlation between a person's age and then a person's aptitude at certain oh, things. Like some people do continue to to sort of educate themselves throughout life, and, and but but it's not it's not typical. It's not like the case for every single person. Yeah. So there's this sense that you know you can't teach an old dog new tricks, meaning that once you hit adulthood, you can't really change yourself very much, and that is absolutely untrue. Mm. But to begin with, they tried to prove that adults can change their brains by like comparing professional musicians to amateur musicians, Mm. uh, scanning their brains and showing that the part of the brain, the motor cortex that controls finger movements was denser and physically larger in the professionals compared to the amateurs. Uh, And and this was when they were matched by age, matched by gender, matched by all of these other things. With everything else being equal, professionals had a more sophisticated development of this particular brain area controlling finger movements for obvious reasons. And in both Mm. hands for pianists and in string players, uh, uh, violinists or guitarists it's the fretboard hand only interesting so if you left hand on the fretboard the right side of the brain's different hmm. but then in neuroscience circles they're like yeah but we never saw we never saw the changes happening it hmm. could have been that just those people who ended up being professionals always had a much bigger more developed motor cortex area <laughs> right. so the great thing about that taxi driver study was that it, it proved to every single human on the planet whether they drive or not that People who start the knowledge, which is typically might be in their 20s, might be in their 30s, sometimes in their 40s, if you scan their brain before they've learned uh, 10,000 major routes around London, um, 25,000 landmarks distributed around within a 10 mile radius of of central London. It's it's just a mind bogglingly difficult memory test. It takes about 2.2 years to, to, to get to the point where you can successfully pass the knowledge. But scan them before they've started learning all those routes and landmarks. Scan them again afterwards. And then the rearmost part of the hippocampus, which I mentioned earlier, the memory banks, becomes physically larger and, and more densely packed with neurons and synapses in as a result of having done all of that training. So it's not specific to navigating your way around a city. It, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, a point of proof um, that adults can learn new things even really complex new things and having done so uh, it will physically change the structure of the brain because that's the only way you can retain it you know um so we haven't found examples of you know before and after people changing their linguistic abilities people changing their visual abilities people changing their acoustic uh, you know sound processing abilities but you can kind of you can take the principle from the taxi drivers, the taxi drivers who change their hippocampus and apply that principle to anything. And that's called neuroplasticity. Mm. If you, if you, if you regularly practice on a daily basis rather than weekly or monthly, mm. if, if you, if, if you do it intensively, so you push yourself out of your comfort zone, um, you know, not too hard, not too 
tough, sorry, not too tough, not too easy, but just right somewhere, somewhere in the middle where you're just gently pushed each time. And then you keep it up over long periods of time. You will physically change your brain. And the most recent, uh, one of the additions in the second edition of uh, Sort Your Brain Out was um, that if you do meditation, you can see changes in a brain area. Like having never meditated before, you get some changes after two weeks, more changes after four weeks, more changes after eight weeks. But you're physically changing the gray matter and the white matter in a certain part of your brain that's involved in meta-awareness, which mm -hmm. is basically your ability to take a step back from what you're thinking and feeling and just uh, monitor what, what, what's going on in your head in a sort of, um, in, in a non-judgmental way. And the more often you do that, the better you become at it. And then the better you become at it, the better able you are to, to modulate, to control your moods and to um, manage your anxiety better. So, you know, taxi drivers prove the navigation and the hippocampal changes. Mm. Medi lots of meditation studies have been done over the last 10 years, 10, 20 years, uh, showing that meditation also changes the brain in, in a positive and helpful way. Wow, that's so, oh God, that's such a relief. <laughs> that's such a relief. Just because like, I, you know, I'm a linguist. I've been a linguist most of my life. And then when I try to start learning um, Arabic, like at a much older age, because I'd learned, like, uh, I, I speak Mandarin, I speak Hindi. And then, Do you? Like, yeah. I tried Mandarin. That's a tough language to learn. It is Congrats. a tough language, <laughs> but I stuck at it for about seven years and got my degree in it. And so my wow. brain was able to kind of process after when I tried to learn Arabic, my brain just was like, no, nope, not having it. I cannot tr pronounce any of these words. And I was like, oh, is this it? Is has my brain officially shut down? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so um, that's good to know, because I was worried that it was my brain that was the problem and not the fact that I wasn't practicing regularly or like reaching that optimum point of like you're making sure it's challenging enough to actually learn so I think okay that's that's good to know because I was just like oh no I've lost my ability to learn like learn anything new so I was just like okay that's that is really that is, is really there a is always hope like the 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 speed at which you might learn things might slow down ever so slightly but you will you will get there in the end Oh, thank God. Uh, that's that is really good news. And you know, speaking of like change, because obviously lots of things have been changing recently, especially with pandemic related issues. And, you know, and you mentioned this, it was such an important point about multitasking, which is obviously like has been proven to be a myth. And I'm just wondering, do you think workplaces are adapting this kind of understanding? Do they realize that this doesn't work? And that, you know, because there's still this huge kind of productivity angle and productivity machine that always sort of kind of, even though the neuroscience shows that it doesn't work. So do you think there's been a change at all in that aspect? In attitudes to, to multitasking? Mm. Um, well, I guess companies are quite, like I, I do a lot of talks uh, or used to back in the days of conferencing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I gave talks for, companies across all sorts of different industry sectors and there is real resistance to the idea like so for example I talk about creative napping like it's it's crazy that if someone has got like a food baby in their belly having eaten too much for lunch and they're feeling a bit sleepy and they're sort of pretending to be productive because they're in the office and they need to keep up appearances um, and then they sort of struggle through the next hour working at kind of 20 percent of their actual ability it, it, it's, it's really inefficient compared mm -hmm. to if you were to sort of just take a 10 15 minute nap um, and then the remaining 45 minutes of the hour you'd be able to work at almost full efficiency mm -hmm. you know like and so companies <clears throat> And also that there are other benefits to napping, as in you get you dip into the hypnagogic state and, uh, and 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 you can be more creative. You can you can kind of find solutions to your problems much more easily if you've worked really hard at it, and then you sort of quiet in your mind and almost on the verge of dropping off to sleep. That's when these eureka moments um, come into mind. So so companies resist that kind of thing because on the one hand they appreciate the science and they can see the, the, the logic in it but on the other hand to shift the culture to allow people to have a nap every day some companies do but it's mm. rare it tends to be the, the high flying companies the yeah. more maverick companies the bigger ones who like to show off that they're different but your average firm doesn't do that in terms of multitasking um, it's sort of like the, the email overload thing you know mm. people um, not having sufficient 
um, discipline in terms of kind of copying in the whole team on every last little thing, you know? And so on the one hand, people can't get anything done if their inbox is constantly pinging because they're, they're involved in multiple teams and every member of every team copies them into everything, you know? So on the one hand, it's handy if they do that because then if you ever need to go back, you can search all your emails and find that, 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 that relevant thing. But in terms of, you know, interrupting your flow of thought, if, you, if, if you're dealing with constant interruptions because either a visual pop-up comes in the corner of your screen or, um, you know, an yeah. auditory ping distracts you from your train of thought, but there's, I hate to think the number of missed opportunities in terms of if people just had peace and quiet for 10, 15 minutes at a time, so that they could complete what they were doing in one go rather than having to do it in little one, two, three minute sprints, they would be so much more productive overall. Mm. And I don't, I haven't heard of any companies who have specifically addressed this problem. Um, I try to urge people to take matters into their own hands and like carve out an hour or two a day, um, perhaps an hour or two in the morning, an hour or two in the afternoon, where they sort of train all of their colleagues to know that I, I will not be checking my emails through this time. You will not be able to get hold of me uh, on the phone during these times. Um, you know, so because if, if you just sort of switch off at random times and people have an expectation that they'll be able to get in touch with you, that could wind people up. But if people become aware or, or maybe you have to ask permission, you know, mm -hmm. to work out the best time of day to do it. But, yeah. you know, to, to just sort of have an out of office email set up to come on, let's say between the hours of 10, 30 and 11, 30 and, and 3 30 and 4 30 every day. Like mm -hmm. surely for two hours a day, people can do without absolute immediate responses. So long as they know where they stand, so long as they get feedback saying, I'll get back to you by the end of the day, but just not immediately. And so I think it's, you know, the solution to the, the, the the ludicrous proposition of expecting people to get everything they need to do done efficiently um, under conditions of intensive multitasking um, is, is to basically sort of condition others to realize that you need to carve out times where, you, mm. where you're not to be disturbed in order to get that really deep thinking done. Oh God, yeah, no, definitely. I, I totally agree with you in that. Uh, it is true. It's true. It's just a culture that has to change quite a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And it's weird because actually, I was thinking of um, some of the other aspects that uh, the book covers, but which one was um, the expectations, which I thought was fascinating because um, I, I didn't, you know, obviously we do have some kind of notion that what we see isn't exactly what we see. Um, you know, some most of it's actually an illusion. Uh, uh, but obviously, you know, in terms of like how a brain interprets information, how do we challenge kind of assumptions that we make if some of it's like based on expectations and kind of patterns? Mm. Um, yeah, so there's necessarily there's a lot of gap filling that goes on in perception. Like, for example, where the optic nerve comes out the back of the eyeball, there's a blank spot in your retina. We don't notice it because one eye, one eye's visual uh, visual uh, area covers the blank spot of, of the other eye, and vice mm -hmm. versa. But there's there's you know wallpapering done over a big hole in in what each of our eyes can see, um, and, and and until you sort of you know there's a, a thing you can do where you look just to the side of something you can you can you can. Some king used to use this. Uh, what once they discussed, were taught this by their physician. They used to use it to chop off people's heads oh, by looking just to the side of them, putting the head over thing, and then yeah, they'd entertain themselves that way. But yeah, so um, so so that wallpapering over that sort of uh, like you know visual and auditory sensations where you d you don't have the full information, but your brain's able to sort of fill in the gaps. It's useful under most circumstances, but it can also mean that you can end up sort of imagining that someone said something they didn't or imagining that you saw something um, that you didn't, especially if you're, if you're being asked retrospectively, like with false witness testimony, if, if, the, if the line of questioning is misleading, what color mm -hmm. trousers was the ass assailant wearing? Um, yeah. You'll completely forget that they were wearing shorts, not trousers, you know, or a skirt instead of trousers. Because you, anyway, so, so there, are, there are various ways we need to be aware that, there are holes in our perception and you might feel really, really sure you saw or heard something, but there's always that possibility that it was your brain doing what it so brilliantly does and, and filling in the gaps and sort of wallpapering over the lack of information to create a seamless experience. But in terms of expectation, like, you know, expectation in the sense of how much will you enjoy something? 
if you have, we all know that if you have really, really high expectations, then you know it can be very, very hard to match those expectations. Mm. And so if you've, let's say, been to see a brilliant film and you want to recommend it to other people, you absolutely should not say, you've got to see this film. It's so good because, it, you know, it will set the bar so high yeah. that no matter how good the film is, it will never get, it will never quite, you know, reach that point. So I always um, s- suggest to people that you kind of underplay it. If, if, you, if, you, if you hated it, just fine, say you hated it, be blunt, because then they might be happily surprised if they do see mm. it. But if you love the film and you want other people to enjoy it, you should recommend it along the lines of, you know, like, Okay, this film is definitely worth watching. It's not the best film you'll ever see in your life, even though you think it really is the best film you've mm. ever seen. You hold that back, but um, but you know, it's it's definitely worth a go. Just don't get your hopes up too much, and then and then they'll be perfectly conditioned. They'll go mm-hmm. in, and then with relatively low expectations, or you could say same for you know food in a restaurant or whatever. If they go in with like some expectations, but not overly high expectations, then there's a much greater chance that they will come out satisfied. Mm, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Do, so any is any of this uh, to do with sort of the reward kind of aspect? Exactly. It's exactly to do with the reward pathway. Right. And how how important do you think like rewards are in decision making? I mean, the reward pathway is everything. Or, or you mean reward like uh, prizes, um, giving people positive feedback. So... So decision making is entirely reliant on the reward pathway. It's a part of the brain that uses dopamine. I mean, there are three major systems of the brain that use dopamine. One for like movement, which is why people with Parkinson's have problems with their dopaminergic pathways. Um, But those dopaminergic pathways are not in the reward system. And then also people with uh, schizophrenia have dopamine problems. In that case, you you need to suppress it because the um, hallucinations and the uh, delusions that people with schizophrenia have uh, to do with having a, a, a very high level of dopamine, overly a hy- hyped up dopamine system in a yeah. third part of the brain, um, which is also not the reward system. So the only reason I say that is because people often go dopamine, reward, reward, dopamine. Mm. But the story is much, much more complex than that. Um, I think I touched on it a little bit and sort your brain out. But the reward pathway is involved in pleasure. So, you know, if you, if you, drink uh, have a drink when you're thirsty then you f- that satisfaction you get from quenching your thirst is thanks to the reward pathway um and if you eat food when hungry the same thing if you have sex all of these things give us pleasure because they help us stay alive for long enough to reproduce and you know all biology really cares about or, or evolution really cares about is to propagate the species it doesn't really care about whether we're happy or sad it cares about do we survive for long enough to pass on our genes and Mm. obviously some people that have kids i'm talking about evolutionarily how did human brains come to be that way Mm. now the reward pathway of the brain um it also is involved not just in experiencing pleasures in the moment you know was that a great film was that a delicious piece of food or was it just okay Um, or was it horrible um it's also involved in trying to predict future rewards so you know, if you've got a decision between three different things, let's say, what, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Will it be uh, like Italian pasta, Chinese takeaway or Indian food? And you can picture three t- dishes that you might have from each of those cuisines. And your reward pathway will fire when you think of each of those mm. in a manner according to your prediction of how rewarding it will be if you had one, one or the other, uh, one or the other or the other. <laughs> And so your decision will basically be based nine times out of 10 on whichever of those three dishes triggered the biggest response in a part of the reward pathway called the nucleus accumbens. Mm -hmm. And so whilst the part that registers immediate pleasure is in a part called the the VTA, the ventral tegmentor area, which is in the midbrain, just on top of the brainstem, this uh, nucleus accumbens area is like on the underside of the frontal lobes, deep, deep in the middle. Um, And then the outcome of that decision, whether it went, you know, whether that dish you had was as good as you expected or not, there's another part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex, just above the eye orbits. Mm. And that sort of looks at the ultimate decision um, and, th- and then gives feedback to those other brain areas to update it. So if the food you had, you thought would be great and it was lousy, then it downgrades that predicted reward response for later. 
Um, and if it was better than expected, then it'll upgrade it for later. So say your favorite food in the world is Italian, um, but you have a dodgy Italian dish. And then so next time around, you'll be more likely to choose the Chinese or the Indian dish, if you see what I mean. Um, so so the, the most interesting thing about the reward pathway is, is that, you know, it's very, very sensitive to, to surprises. So if, um, you know, you know that you're going to get something nice, but it's surprisingly good, then that creates a big, a big, big impact in the, in the activity and the reward pathway. Um, and so you, you'd be delighted with what's happened. And, and, and similarly, it goes the other way. If, mm. you, if you have an expectation of reward and that, that expectation is not met, the reward pathway signal just dampens. It, it, it kind of flatlines completely. And that sort of correlates to feeling really, really hacked off. And whether you're feeling delighted or hacked off, it creates a sort of a strong emotional response, which makes those scenarios much more memorable than if it just sort of ran according to your to, 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 to your expectations in the first place. So the idea being that our decisions only get better if we learn from the surprisingly good outcomes and the surprisingly mm. bad outcomes so that we have a better chance of putting us in the way of more of those surprisingly good ones. You know, we can change our behavior and habits to try and get, get in front of those good outcomes more often. And vice versa, you know, once bitten, twice shy. If, if you've had a terrible experience with, say, a certain brand or a certain cert, certain place, then, you know, when you go close, you know, when you go close to the doorway of that place, you, the memory will come up, that sinking feeling of how disappointed you were. And, um, and, and that's basically how the reward pathway steers our behaviours for, uh, for, for better or for worse hilariously you know that it just it, the imme- first thing that sparked into my head was like the other day we ha- we had our usual Chinese and we tried something different and it was terrible and <laughs> immediately it's like we're never going back there Rick. yeah right well I mean that's why <laughs> you know that's why people do tend to go for their favorites because they know what they like and they know and as much as I mean I do the same thing as much as I try to go off piece yeah you have to take the hit of let's say trying five new dishes yeah. you're not going to love all of those five as much as your favorite dishes so if you want to find that you know possibly the best dish ever you have to be able to you have to be willing to take a few hits yeah. um, of, of dissatisfaction in order to track down that thing that's like the best thing ever but you know fortune favors the bold <laughs> Indeed, yeah. indeed. And actually, speaking of like reward, I'm like, this is one thing I find I do myself. And I, I know a lot of people who do this, which is the boom and bust cycle of exercise. You know, people who exercise a lot, and then just basically stop mm. uh, for long periods, because they like the dopamine kind of high, or the, you know, the endorphins sort of rising as they're doing it. But then it goes to the other side too extreme and then they mm. can't do anything. So how do you deal with that? Little and often. Yeah. The problem is when people finally get their ass down to the gym or to the park to do a run or to the athletics track or to the whatever it is that people do for exercise, they have a tendency to think quite understandably, whilst I'm here, I might as well make the most of it. Yeah. But then there's, you know, the, the prospect of you end up being punished by achy legs or arms overnight that waking you up in the night and annoying you meaning you're a bit grumpy the next day because you didn't sleep properly or um you know the next day you're, you're still you you can either make the the the, the 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 perceived exertion whilst you're doing it can be like quite unpleasant so mm-hmm. then you don't want a repeat of that the reward pathway learns that okay i know this is good for me but it wasn't that pleasurable if you're mm-hmm. really hitting it hard I mean, other people will experience that same level of perceived exertion yeah. as, as fun, but we all have the possibility of overdoing it and regretting it. Whereas, you know, the kind of type of exercise that people are advised to do for the benefits to their body, very different from the type of exercise that you do if, you, if you're mainly interested in your brain health. Hmm. And if you, you know, rather than exercising intensively, uh, if you just exercise moderately for 15, 20 minutes a day, meaning you get a little bit out of breath, you, you lightly perspire. If you do that on a daily basis or every other day, you're much more likely to be able to keep it up for the rest of your life compared mm. to if you hit the gym once a week or once a fortnight and then absolutely smash it. Yeah. A, that's not good for you because you need to be conditioned and you need to gradually build up what you do. Um, and, 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 and C, what? 
Did I go from <laughs> A to C? How did it? Well, let's 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 go with it. Why not? Why should Why you go from not? A to B? But you know, so so little and often is 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 the way to go. Um, uh, it, it, it works brilliantly because whilst the endorphins that you mentioned, studies have shown that it's actually you have to exercise really hard for a long time like 45 50 minutes of intensive exercise before the endorphins come out mm. to play and that's what gives you the, like the runner's high where you feel really really like you're on drugs you're so high um but the good news is it only takes 10 to 15 minutes of moderate exercise to get the endocannabinoids so the yeah. naturally produced cannabis like substance that our brain you know naturally produces um as a sort of reward for doing light exercise um so yeah little and often uh, don't don't hit it too hard yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Sue. So I've I've got to go soon. I've only oh got yeah, five I, I knew. Yeah, I had a feeling this might be the case. I apologise. I had so many questions. It was ridiculous. That's all right. Give me uh, one more. Okay, I, I'll do one more, and then we'll we'll call it a day. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. So, um, okay. So, do you think social connections were hampered during lockdown? Oh my um, god! Yes. And yeah, and like, what is the best way to socialise if you can't have direct contact with people? Virtual reality. Seriously. Honestly, I, I know not everyone has um, access to VR headsets, but they used to cost 3,000 quid. To, like five years ago, if you wanted to get into VR, a, a half-decent virtual reality experience, you'd have to have a 2,000 pound, two, two and a half thousand pound PC, and then 500 quid's worth of virtual reality headset wow. kit. Now, you can get involved for 300 quid. You don't even need a computer. And the reason, so people think of like Beat Saber, like, games where you sh hit these blocks as they come towards you. But the reason I think virtual reality is so, so good is because th th there is this social aspect. So for example, I have a friend, he lives in, in Bristol and he, you know, he and his wife do not earn a lot of money, um, but you know, they both work in the education world and uh, he managed to convince her to get him an Oculus Quest 2 for Christmas. Right. And this is a dear friend of mine from university days. And I usually get to see him once, maybe twice a year. And since he got this headset, we've been meeting up in virtual reality because you can play games together in virtual mm. reality. Two people, five people, 10 people. You can meet up with whoever you want. And we've been playing mini golf on a weekly basis wow. since he got it at Christmas. So I've been hanging out with my mate Ed, who I love dearly. And I just don't usually get to see that much, um, uh, you know, weekly. And it's, 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 it's just so, so lovely. And another friend moved abroad. Um, he got a quest years ago and, and we met up in virtual reality yesterday. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it feels a bit high tech, right? But if you, if you don't consider a mobile phone to be high tech, if you're that kind of person where a mobile phone is every day, trust me, in the next four to five years, putting on a VR headset to hang out with friends and family would become normal. And mm -hmm. so the reason, it, so when you're in there, you're represented by an avatar. You know, it's like not your face. It's just a sort of cartoon character face. But the key thing is you can see the people's hand movements. You can see the way their head moves. And with your head and hands, you might not get facial expressions, but you really get a sense of their body language. And if you know the person well, their mannerisms come through in virtual reality. And mm. also that sense of proximity, like right here on a screen, you're like a flat screen in front of me mm. and I'm here and i get no sense of where you are in relation to me particularly if it's sort of multiple people in a zoom call or whatever yeah it's rubbish because you can yeah. see their faces but you can't use the the, the 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 many parts of the brain are specialized for social interaction because yeah. socializing being connected to others is so important and on a 2d screen you just don't those brain the, the very important body language facial expressions like inflections of voice it, it doesn't work so well. Whereas if you're physically in space together mm. and when you get closer to a person, their voice gets louder. And when you move away from their voice gets quieter, you know, person to the right of you, the, the, the sound of their voice is louder in the right ear than the left ear person to the left of you, vice versa. You get a sense of being present in the room with them. Mm. So even though it's not perfect, it doesn't look like them. You still feel like you're with them, even though it doesn't look like them. And, and that's the bit which it's so you cannot, you can't watch a video of people interacting in, in, in virtual reality and, 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 and grasp that. It's impossible yeah. to grasp. You can only experience it. So, look, I know 300 quid is, is a lot of money. Um, but, you know, people save up for 
computer consoles for their kids or for themselves, you know, like Xbox or PlayStation. Mm. And, and it's, it's, it's a not dissimilar price point. So yeah. my, my, my point is it's, uh, you know, just like we used to think you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And now we've learned actually you can learn new things throughout adulthood, albeit maybe at a slightly slower rate. The same should be said for technology. Like it, VR seems like it's not for me for some people, you know, but, but be open-minded and save up because if you feel disconnected from other people, it really can make you feel like you're, you're, you're side by side with them in an intimate way. You know, um, yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. God, I've got to try it out. That sounds amazing. God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I'm like really appreciate it. And, you know, thank you for spending a bit of your time with me. This, Pleasure, uh, this afternoon. Thanks for having me. I, I mean, it was lovely of you to get in touch. So no, it's, absolutely. Been, it's been really fun. Thanks you for too. letting me share. <laughs>